mercy. It's all true. It's all true. I was sitting there depressed on my sofa in Fashion Valley. No car, no friends, watching Terry. And I thought, what a phony. <laughs> Seriously, I thought, she is so phony. But she did make one good point. I'll watch her next week. <laughs> and it really was like that for six months before I ever actually went to the church, which was then at the El Cortez, um, because I still had a lot of undoing. I'd been raised Catholic. I'd been a Mormon for a minute. Uh, <laughs> I tried on all the religions, <laughs> like sweaters. Some nice things about this, but... <laughs> um, so I did, I thought, she's like a used car salesperson. It's all so slick and highly produced. And she's just fooling these people. But I did like that thing she said. And then I would just keep watching. It took a while to just kind of dissolve away all of the old programming. And that's kind of what everything still is to this day. That for some of those of you who have not seen me before or for a while, tell my story of um, several years ago, I was at this little restaurant that I go to, in fact, place that John and Reverend Patty and even Joel have come when they drive up to LA and we have lunch at this little place called Basics where I go and have lunch every day with two glasses of wine. <laughs> every day, it's medicinal. <laughs> so, but by the time I got there, and I, it's 11.30 every single day, because I get up very, very early, so I'm starving by then. But the day that I got there, there was this gay couple there who had beat me there by probably an hour or so, because they were pretty shit-faced <laughs> on mimosas. And they had both called in sick that day. And they were just having a great, great time. And we were really the only people on the patio. And so the one guy who was the most talkative probably got tired of talking to his husband, was so happy when I sat down, and he just sort of turned all of his attention then onto me. Who are you? What are you about? What's happening? And I had, as I always do, I always have books with me. So I had a Neville Goddard book, and I can't remember what the other one was. Well, it turned out this guy was in PR, and he, I think he had like Taco Bell or some like big companies that he worked for. And so he was going to give me the benefit of his wisdom. So one of the things he said was, what's that book you're reading? So I pulled out the Neville book, and it had, it was, I forget what it was called, but it had like dark clouds and stuff on it. He was like, no, that's a horrible title. It's a horrible cover. It'll never sell. I'm like, this guy's been dead for 30 years. I don't think he really cares. <laughs> But he was all about marketing and selling and all of this kind of stuff. And so he was talking about all of that. And then finally he said to me, and what is it that you do? And I said, I deprogram people from what you do. <laughs> and that's kind of what we do here. Is, all of the stuff that we teach here is very, very simple. You could put it in a pamphlet. It's not that hard to figure out. You don't have to uh, even take a seminar to learn pretty much everything there is to it. The work is not in learning it. The work is in unlearning everything else. And that's continual because the world has so much access to it and probably has more access to it than ever before because of the internet and because we have 5,000 news programs and channels and all of these things in which we are inundated with information all the time, and most of it bullshit, but inundated with it all the time. In fact, my next book, my 10th book, which will come out in the fall, it'll be the fourth book that I've written with my spirit guides called The Crabby Angels. <laughs> the first book was The Crabby Angels Chronicles. This is the fourth one, it's called The Crabby Angels No Bullshit Guide to peace, joy, and prosperity. <laughs> We're taking the bullshit out of spirituality. <laughs> so
So that's a lot of what I do. And A Course in Miracles, which is one of the things that I studied and talk about, says that miracles don't do anything, miracles undo. So that's mostly what we're doing. I heard, for those of you who know, uh, Michael Beckwith. I remember taking a class years ago with Michael Beckwith where he said, uh, I think he said like 90%, he said 90% of spirituality is letting go. So it's the undoing, it's not the doing. So a lot of times we're all concerned about what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do, when really it's about dissolving and letting go. Letting go of the old limited way of thinking, the way that we're hypnotized. We are hypnotized by the culture all the time. It's their job, they're trying to hypnotize us. If you've seen any of the experts who talk about the internet, and when I was coming here every month we talked about this a lot, about clickbait and what you click on vibrationally. But one of the things that they know on whether it's Facebook or any of these things, is that it is very unlikely that you will click that mouse on something positive. Highly unlikely. You'll just think to yourself, hmm, isn't that nice? I agree with that. But they know if they put something that will scare you or anger you, you will absolutely click on it. If they hit your button, the thing you're upset about, they know you'll click on it. So that's why it's in their best interest to make you angry or afraid. So what we're doing all the time is just dissolving that and letting that go. That's what we call the bullshit. That you start to recognize when you're believing the lie. Oh, I've fallen under the wicked spell again. So here, we do not argue for our limitations. That's what the world does. You argue for your limitations, or you argue for other people's limitations, but we catch ourselves. So I always say, when you start to catch yourself in that thought, I can't, I won't, it doesn't, you go, bullshit! <laughs> <laughs> you just call yourself on it, and you undo it, and then you just turn it around. Read a con. <laughs> When I pulled in, I said, was that parking space for me? And they said, no, it's for Rita Khan. <laughs> God. <laughs> if you don't know Rita Khan, <laughs> when I first started speaking at Pacific Church, when I was doing the Wednesday nights, Rita would be back there, knitting, 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 knitting. And finally, she said to me, I'm knitting sweaters for penguins. It's for the penguins and the oil spills. <laughs> do you still do that? She still knits. <laughs> now the wombats. <laughs> Saving the world. I love it. So <laughs> I just started on Monday. If you want to join in, there's nothing to, to do in terms of you don't have to sign up for anything or let me know or anything. But starting on Monday, I started uh, a 90-day boot camp. I do these from time to time. And so it's just something you do on your own. You don't have to join anything or sign up for anything. But what I called it, the shorthand of it is it's the Divine Love Boot Camp. It was really about love, gratitude, and miracles. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Anybody want to jump right in? 90 days? Come on, that'll, be, that'll just end you right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> Perfect timing to get ready for the holidays with divine love, because that word divine, we want to focus on that. Because a lot of times when we talk about love in these spiritual circles, it's not really understood the way that we mean love. Because too many times people are thinking about, my heart chakra. <laughs> but this is not a love that necessarily has a feeling that goes with it. It's not about affection. It's not about a feeling. It's an impersonal love. So we want to get away in this from the idea of personal love. Divine love is impersonal. And that's the way that you can love people that you don't like and who aren't very lovable. We always start out, 
did all my spiritual work this morning. I'm just filled with love. And then I ran into all these assholes. <laughs> they did not do their spiritual work. <laughs> I would have loved, but they were so unlovable. <laughs> so you have to come up, up from a place that does not have to do with a feeling that you have. Divine love is something that you invoke. It's something that you call forth. The first book that I wrote was called Invocations, Calling Forth the Light that Heals. It's invoking something. There's always at the services an invocation. The invocation, that prayer where you are starting to activate that divine presence. So divine love is something that you activate. It's not something that you're waiting to feel like doing. That was one of the things I got from Terry a million years. There's, I still quote Terry all the time. And one of the things that she said is that you cannot live your life according to your feelings. Now, she didn't mean according to your intuitive feelings. She meant by your emotions. You can't live your life according to your emotions. You can't live your life according to your feelings. Because if you're trying to live the life you choose, to be and do and have what you want, to live as a creator, to live choosing, and to live to your full potential, you can't if you're living by your feelings because most of the time you won't feel like it. <laughs> right? I'd like to go for my vision, but I don't feel like it today. <laughs> so we're not talking about those kinds of emotions. We're talking about invoking something that is in you, but not of you. That's when Jesus said, there is a power in me. It's greater than the power that's in the world. Of myself, I can do nothing, but there is a power within me. Okay? So that's what we're activating when we activate divine love. So... And one of the reasons that I did this was, and it's based on, for those of you who are familiar with Catherine Ponder, I love Catherine Ponder, oh my God. She's still alive, she's the last one TikTok. <laughs> she's the same age as Louise Hay, who passed last year, they're both 91, and Catherine Ponder's still living out there in Palm Desert, doing her thing. Like, she's kind of like me now, we don't leave the house much. I'm in the Mystic Protection Program. <laughs> in my own secret society. So, <laughs> I do everything from home, like Catherine Ponder. But one of my favorite Catherine Ponder, it really is my favorite Catherine Ponder affirmation, is what this whole thing is based on. It's divine love expressing through me now draws to me all that is needed to make me happy and to make my life complete. So that's the first part of the 90 day boot camp is that just every day for 90 days, you say that affirmation out loud. Divine love expressing through me now draws to me everything that is needed to make me happy and to make my life complete. Then the second affirmation is you do it for others. So you can just do it for a particular person or a group of people, it doesn't make any difference. You can just say you. Divine love expressing through you now draws to you all that is needed to make you happy and to make your life complete. And you do that out loud. That's, that sounds easy, doesn't it? You're all like, it's too much. <laughs> just... Rather take a six week seminar, work through my blocks, do past life regressions. Simplicity is very difficult for twisted minds. <laughs> so that's the second part. The third affirmation is, God in me, thank you for the fulfillment of blank. And then just fill it in. Whatever, whether it's for that day or your dream or your vision or whatever it is, thank you for the fulfillment of blank. Remember, it's God in me. There's no God in the sky. There's no one up there to talk to. Nobody pulling strings. No one to petition. No such God exists anywhere. All of new thought is rooted in there is one power and one presence and you're it. That's it. So it is God in me. Thank you 
for the fulfillment through divine love and divine timing, whatever it is. But you say thanks first. You give thanks first. It puts you in the position of assuming that it's already done. I once heard Reverend Ike say, Reverend Ike came and spoke at the church back in the day at Terry's church. Reverend Ike said, thank you seals the deal. Write that shit down. <laughs> thank you seals the deal. So the story he told about that was, and this was probably in the 1960s or 70s that this happened, so the, um, I'll sort of adjust. He was getting his car washed. You know, he was famous for having all these Rolls Royces. So he was getting one of the Rolls Royces washed. So back then it was, I don't know, it was probably $4 to get your car washed. So he talked about how he would always tip a dollar to whoever it was that washed the car. So he said, the car was all washed. I hand the guy the tip. And he said, I'm giving him the dollar. And I look, and as it goes into his hand, I see that it's $5 bill. He said, but at the exact same time, the guy saw that it was $5 and said, thank you. And thank you seals the deal. <laughs> so we thank before, just as Jesus thanked before he called Lazarus forth, right? He said, Father, I know that you always hear me and everything I say, and I don't even have to say it, but I'm saying for these nitwits over here who are listening in because they don't understand how principle works, so I'm going to say it so that they get that it's all done, so I'm saying thank you now, Lazarus, come forth. Right? He thanks and breaks the bread. So the thanks comes before the experience. The thanks comes before the manifestation. So it is, thank you, God, in me for the fulfillment, the joyous, easy fulfillment, blah, 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 well, however you want to say it, right? In perfect timing, in perfect ways for the highest good of all concerned, right? The next part is, I give myself permission to manifest my dreams. I give myself permission. Do you know that you have to give yourself permission? There are lots of things that you want that you're not experiencing because you still have not given yourself permission. You're waiting for someone else to, and they're not going to. No one is coming to save you, by the way. <laughs> Call off the search. Bring in the dogs. Nobody's coming. You're the one. Right? So you have to give yourself permission. And then the last one is, it is safe for me to manifest my dreams because you have to know that you're safe. You have to know that you're safe. A lot of times we're not experiencing what we know and experience because we don't think it's safe. I couldn't be trusted with that much money. I couldn't be trusted if I was living my dream. I couldn't be trusted. People would want me for the wrong reasons. So you have to give yourself permission and you have to let yourself know that you're safe, all right? Then you just do that for 90 days, that's all. That won't even take you five minutes. And it's free. That's why I know almost no one here will do it. <laughs> it's too easy and it's free. Right? People in America, we love to struggle. Oh, we love to struggle. You know, when I was here, like the theme this month, a world that works for everyone is here. This is it. We're in it. It does. We live in a world that works for everybody because it is a law-based universe. It is based on principle and law. So it already works for everyone. To say we want a world that works for everyone is Sort of like saying, what we want is a gravity that works for everyone. <laughs> well, it's a good thing, because we have that. We have a gravity that works for everyone. That doesn't mean you don't still fall the fuck down. <laughs> and that you don't still have to learn how it works, but it works the same for everyone. And this is why... Jesus said, 
Go out and teach the gospel. Because the reason it seems like it's not working for everyone is because everyone doesn't know the gospel. What is the gospel? <laughs> First of all, gospel means good news. So the gospel has nothing to do with anybody being crucified because that ain't good news. <laughs> Let's just get real here, okay? <laughs> good news sounds good. That's how we know it's good news. So what is it that Jesus said? He said, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. What will we call that now? A mission statement. This is my purpose. This is my intention. This is what I came to tell you. That's the good news. The gospel of good news is life more abundant. That's the gospel. Now, to say go spread that, where, where he said go out. Well, first of all, he said, preach to the poor. What's good news for the poor? Couldn't be crucifixion. Oh, the good news. <laughs> the good news is there's this crazy dude in the sky who's enraged at all of you, but I'm his favorite. And he said, if you let them slaughter you, I'll be OK. That's not good news. That's insanity, right? It makes no sense whatsoever. It's insane. A Course of Miracles says that the crucifixion was merely an extreme teaching example, which is that the body isn't real. That's why in John, Jesus said, I lay my life down that I may take it up again. No man takes it from me. It is within my power to lay it down, so it is with my power to take it up again. I'm not a victim. They're not doing it to me. No one is killing me. This is an example to show you I will, in three days, come back again in this same body. It will have changed, but I will pick it up again to show you there is no death. That's good news. The good news for the poor is you do not have to be poor. They tortured Jesus, all of his apostles, who were the worst team ever. <laughs> what a sad, pitiful team. <laughs> all the time, trying to get him to start a political or social movement. And he said, that's not your problem. It will do nothing. Political change will do nothing. Social change will do nothing. That is not your problem. You're transformed by the renewing of your mind, not by the renewing of the administration. That has nothing to do with what you're experiencing. It is all in you. You are invoking your power, or you are giving it away and saying, they took it from me. So that's what 90 days is. Divine love expressing through me is now drawing to me all that is needed to make me happy and to make my life complete. Now, that's the old school Catherine Ponder. I know that one by heart. I love that one. That just gives you the kickoff. You can use that one. But you can shorthand it all day long into divine love is healing my skin. Divine love is finding my parking place. Divine love is healing our marriage. Divine love is renewing my mind. Divine love is putting money in my bank account. Divine love is helping me forgive my sister. Divine love is showing me the way. Divine love is giving me guidance. Divine love is lining me up with my promotion. Divine love, divine love, divine love. It's not, affirmations are not magic spells. The exact words don't matter because all it matters is what it awakens in you. But I do want you to really consider using those two words, divine love. Because we want our creations to be from that. Not from a place of, 
I'm not enough, but if I got this, maybe people would love me or maybe I'd be safe. You want to come from a place of divine love is doing this. And it's the divine selection. That's a, a Florence Scovel Shin would always talk about the divine selection. Not getting attached to particular people. See, that's the one thing, that's the caveat to all of this that a lot of times they don't tell you about. When they say, you can have whatever you want. <laughs> as long as it doesn't interfere with the free will of anybody else. You understand that? That's why you can't necessarily have that job because maybe they don't want you there and they have free will. Not marry that person because that person has free will. But you can have the essence of that. That's why Florence Scovelshin would always teach people to say the divine selection. Right? I want to get married. I want to have this kind of a marriage. I want to have this kind of a mate. And I want it to be the divine selection. Not Bob. <laughs> Maybe Bob don't want your sorry ass. <laughs> that was the other thing that Terry used to say. There are certain things that she said that just never left my mind from the second she said them. And this was like around husband number four, where she was talking about <laughs> this very thing, because she was saying, when you, she said, you know that person you want so bad, I hope you get them. She said, plenty of people prayed to get me, got me, and wished they hadn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you want it to be the divine selection. That's about the content, not the form of the particular person. That's the feeling that you want to have, the feeling of abundance, the feeling of health, the feeling of vitality, the feeling of joy. And that's really the work, is just the reprogramming of our minds all the time, over and over and over again, every day. It's never, that's one of the things that I love so much about Louise, is that she knew it never stopped. When she died at 91, she was still discovering new ways to be free. She was in her 70s and 80s still breaking, not breaking through, that's the other thing about Louise, is she was so careful about words, that she would have never used a word like break, because it's violent. You never broke a pattern, you dissolved a pattern. We want to get away from our aggressive, violent way of talking about things. In that, you know, there's a DVD uh, movie of You Can Heal Your Life, and they, there's all these sort of talking heads, like Wayne Dyer is in it, and all these people. And there's this one guy who's talking about um, working with Louise, and I can't, I, he was a teacher maybe, and like we're, you know, traveling with Louise or whatever, and he said, you know, you cannot rush Louise, because everything with Louise is in divine timing and perfect ways. <laughs> so he said, like, you just give up after a certain point, because you'd be like, okay, Louise, like if we do this and we do this, then we could kill two birds with one stone. And she'd go, why would we kill birds? <laughs> <laughs> like, just, like the violence of our language, you know? It's always the looking at how you're getting aggressive and you're trying to make stuff happen instead of aligning with principle and letting it happen. The activation of this is not about working harder. It's about alignment, alignment, alignment. It's about consciousness, consciousness, consciousness. And it is the continual feeding our mind. So, well into her 70s and 80s, Louise would be like, I think she was in her 70s when she started dancing and doing ballroom dancing and taking classes. And it was because in grade school, the teacher said that she had big feet and was clumsy. So she would never danced. And it wasn't, she was already had been in metaphysics for a million years and had founded Hay House before she realized, oh, I'm not dancing because of something that I was sold in grade school. So what do you do when you find a new limiting thought? You get excited. You don't go, oh, God, no, I can't believe now. I still have to do more work on this. How long am I going to have to be doing this? <laughs> You're excited because you go, oh, and I just turn it around. I'm too clumsy to dance. I'm learning to dance. 
I'm willing to learn to dance. It's safe. I give myself permission to learn to dance. It is safe for me to learn to dance. So you just start filling your mind with encouragement to know that you can be who you want to be, you can do what you want to do, and you can have what you want to have. Let's say that. I can be who I want to be. I can do what I want to do. I can have what I want to have. That's permission. To give yourself permission because you know it might upset some people. How fun. <laughs> they need to be upset. Good for you. They were asleep. Now you're off living your life. It's disturbing. <laughs> they need to be disturbed. Good, or they wouldn't be in your space. Right? So it's the continual, I can be who I want to be, not who the media and the culture says I should be. Not who I should be by this point in my life or my career. Not who my family would like for me to be. I can be who I want to be. I can do what I want to do, even if it looks silly to people in my family. Even if they're not proud of me because of it, even if it disturbs them on some level. I can still do what I want to do. Not to hurt anybody, not to spite anybody, but because it's my joy, because I'm following my joy, what makes my heart sing. I can do what I want to do. I see this more and more as I work with people over the years, where they start giving themselves permission to do things, to go places. It's fascinating. I can have what I want to have, as much or as little. You don't have to worry about what other people are going to think about what you have. Reverend Ike, who had like, I don't know, maybe a dozen or more of these Rolls Royces. Now, you can just only drive the one <laughs> at a time. You know, <laughs> what do you need all these Rolls Royces for? And there were a lot of people who judged him for that. But you have to remember that Reverend Ike was really at the height of his ministry from probably the early 70s to the maybe late 60s to the early 80s. This is when black people are just coming out of segregation. And he wanted to show, because he was a very opulent, so he always wore very fancy suits, and had a very fancy stage, would have like a throne sort of, you know, and have his, all his Rolls Royce. And he basically said, I have to impress this on their subconscious minds, because it was a largely black audience of people. I have to impress upon them that they can have this. They have to see it. I can't just stand here and talk about it. They have to see it so that it gets impressed upon their subconscious mind that this is possible for them. That this, because if you were living in an age where it wasn't even possible for you to drink from the same fountain as other people, then you're being told, not even subconsciously, you're less than and you're not good enough and you can't have what other people have. You cannot be who you want to be, you cannot do what you want to do, and you cannot have what you want to have. And the culture is outright saying that to you. So he was showing them through tangible things so that it would impress upon their subconscious mind because he didn't need all those Rolls Royces. But sometimes you have to show people things. This is why Jesus would sometimes show people miracles, but his message wasn't about miracles. That was just to get their attention and start to impress upon their subconscious mind. It didn't work, P.S., by the way. They still thought it was about the stuff, right? He said, I have to go away or you're just going to become dependent on me. You still don't get that it's not me, it's you. You want me, now you're just dependent on me. We want more of the bread. <laughs> How about some more of that bread <laughs> and fish, right? Now they're not coming back for the message anymore. They're like, we want to see the magic bread and fish, right? But it's not about that. It's about there is a power in you. 
activate it to be who you want to be, to do what you want to do, to have what you want to have. And that's all I'm doing. I'm standing here talking to myself, because I need this as much as anyone, and then I just allow people to listen for money. <laughs> you can come listen to me talk to myself, but I have to charge you for it. So and that's the, this, uh, the latest book that I wrote. This one just came out, Power Thoughts for Teens and Young Adults. But it's really for anybody. And it's just 365 days of affirmative statements. So it really is a programming of the mind so that the idea is in the morning, not at night. Do you ever notice this? When you're growing up, they teach you to pray at night when it's too late. <laughs> what the hell? Are we? It's all over now. <laughs> the ridiculousness of the culture that we live in. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before... What? I might die? <laughs> Why are we telling our children, you might die? <laughs> Better pray that your soul goes to heaven in case you die tonight. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so morning is when we want to do our affirmations and our prayer treatments. Morning in the morning, right? <laughs> Starting the day in alignment with infinite source. So that's all this is, is it's just, I mean, you could use it for anyone. I haven't, I mean, there are some of it that's geared towards younger people, but not necessarily. I mean, some of the things are things like, I am not responsible for my parents' choices. Don't you wish someone would have told you that when you were a kid? <laughs> I am not responsible for my family or parents' choices, <laughs> right? If your parents are alcoholics or depressed or whatever, that you're not responsible for that. It has nothing to do with you, and you can't fix them, right? So it's a lot of that stuff. Do you know that the, main, the leading cause of death from people from 10 to 24 is suicide? So we need to be able to start filling their minds with something other than the horse shit that the culture is telling them, right? It's true. So, so it's a way to certainly to start a conversation, but we need it as much, just like I said with Louise at 91. Just because all you have to do, you know, sometimes all you have to do is hear 30 seconds of Susie Orman on PBS and you go right to hell. <laughs> you know, because you're like, oh my God, I don't have a 401k and insurance for this and insurance for that and $500 million saved up and six years worth of this. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to live on the streets eating cat food. <laughs> so then you have to say, oh, bullshit. Thank you for the information, Susie. That may be true for you, but that is not true for me. That's a Louise Hay affirmation. When someone says something, you say, you don't say it to them, but in your mind, you go, that may be true for you, but that is not true for me, right? Somebody's saying to you, well, I don't know where you're going to get a job in this market at your age. It's very hard for people to get hired in this town. And you go, that may be true for you, bitch. But that is not true for me. <laughs> Back to the happy place. <laughs> All right, I know I'm probably talking over my time here. This is the other part. This is very, very important. You want to jot this down too of this 90 day boot camp is that for 90 days, everybody gets a fucking break. It is a 90 days of everybody gets a break. So 
Now, I'm not talking about major, like you find out that your business partner has embezzled all your money. <laughs> but I'm talking about just the normal things of life. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. Someone is a little rude to you at work. Somebody, all those things, you just in your mind say, it's so lucky you did that today. because we are under a 90-day pass system. <laughs> so you have grace. I'm not even going to think about it. It's just dissolved back into the nothingness, OK? <laughs> and you would be surprised, when you have something like that, how much you can let things go. When this, like I said, if somebody cuts you off or some incident occurs, you just go, Nope, I'm in 90 days of everybody gets a break. And that means you too. All of the ways in which you would normally just judge and attack yourself about this, you're not enough this, you're too much that, you're da da da. No, we are on a 90 day pass system. Right? We, not, day 91, we'll pick it all back up again. <laughs> right? <laughs> you can just tell yourself that so you can get through it. <laughs> Boy, day 91, I'm going to make some phone calls, <laughs> right? <laughs> but really, what you'll find is at the end of 90 days, you'll be like, I think I should re-up this, because it worked much better than the old way. So much better than the old way of carrying around grievance after grievance after grievance. Um, I think that probably I should stop now, because it's long enough, right? Just a couple more minutes. OK, just a couple more minutes. <laughs> oh my god. I do want you to think in the coming days as you leave here. And just let don't necessarily make a concerted effort towards it, but to just to start to notice and let your own inner wisdom start to bring to you the ways in which you have not really been giving yourself permission. Where have I not really been giving? Somebody told me something. Um, I don't know if I should tell this. I don't think sh Well, <laughs> she told me this, and I just freaking loved this. But she talked about, I went to Disneyland with a friend a couple of months ago. And so, the, and there are a couple of people who are sort of in this <laughs> group of people that I teach and work with all the time who are Disney people. And so somebody from Seattle who's in this group had emailed me and asked me about, because um, when I had gone, I had gone with a friend of mine whose husband works for Disney. So we had certain special passes and things like that. But there were other things that when we had, I hadn't been to Disney in 25 years or something like that. And so I talked about that. So this woman from Seattle said, well, I'm going to, a friend of mine and I are coming down in December, and we're going to go, and do you have any tips? So then I just put it on this private Facebook page that we have of, does anybody know? So people started giving tips and stuff. And then this woman sent me an email. And this is why, because she, you don't know her, and hopefully none of her family will listen to this. But she said, my, she said, you know, I love Disney. You go all the time. And she said, but she said, uh, I took my family to Hawaii to this Disney resort, da 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 da, for like a week. And she said, it was great, except that there was no rest involved at all because it was with my aging mother who was grouchy the whole time. And then the kids who were all like, and it was great and everything, but she said it was exhausting and stuff. So she said, I came back and I secretly booked a trip just for me in January <laughs> by myself. And I even booked myself first class tickets. And I'm not telling anybody but you. But do you understand, that's permission. She had to give herself the permission to do this thing just for me. Because what she was saying was, I can't really tell them, because they'll want to go. Right? They'll, they'll want to go. And there's that thing of giving yourself permission to take care of you for once, and not everybody else, and everybody has to be included, and everybody has, because somebody might feel bad. Right? 
So she had to give herself permission to say, I want to go, and I'm going to go, and I'm just not going to tell anyone, and I'm going to sneak off and have a fabulous time. So you start to look at the ways in which are you waiting for something? Stop waiting. What are you waiting for? Like this, I'm waiting. Right? It's like, what are you waiting for? You don't know. You, like, you could walk out and be hit by a bus right now. And then all the stuff that you were saving, your kids are going to give that shit away so fast. <laughs> That stuff you save for them, they don't want that shit. <laughs> They're gonna call a truck that's gonna haul that stuff away that you saved and didn't use because it was good. Right? <laughs> so I want you to start to think about that and then I really want you to start to think about the things that you still somehow feel are not safe for you. Things that you really want, but if you're really honest with yourself, you don't feel safe to have it. I don't feel safe to really have the body I want because then I might be too attractive and I might be attacked again or I might be this again or all of those things. And then you just start to build on that. It's not about pushing yourself into a place you're not ready for. Permission doesn't mean, okay, just do it all now. It's the permission then you start to take the little steps forward, right? The Louise Hay thing about when she, she didn't just go sign up for dance classes. Do you know she went and watched for weeks? She wasn't ready to even sign up and make the commitment, but she was ready for the step of, I'm gonna look up the dance studio, then I'm gonna go and watch them do it for a couple weeks to build up my courage, to start to feel good. There, was, there were people who have, um, over the years, come to, when I was doing lectures every week in places like Santa Barbara and even here where people came in and they knew down inside what they wanted the day they walked in and it took them two years to make the first move to do it. I, can, I think of two really clear examples of people who walked into the room knowing they needed to end the marriage they were in and it took them at least a year or two years to do it. And they would come to every single lecture, never miss, just building up their courage to get to the place to take the first step because they didn't feel safe enough to do it. So that's fine because they were going in the right direction. It's not about a race or speeding to get there. It's about as long as you're going in the right direction. And a lot of times the right direction is just investigating. You go and investigate the dance class. You know, some of you know that I, you know, I had not been on a plane for like 18 years until February of this year when I went, when a friend of mine took me to Venice, Italy for carnival. And the funny thing is, is that when he first asked me about it, it was last August. So last August, this time of year, he said, I want to take you out to lunch. He sat down to lunch and he said, do you have a passport? And I, I said, strangely enough, I do. Because I had not been on a plane in 18 years, but I had a fucking passport. <laughs> do you know why I had a passport? In like 2011, I was, oh, I've talked way over the time. Okay, this is my last story. In 2011, <laughs> I told Joel I was going to be good, and I lied. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> in 2011, I was filling in for Marianne, I was living in LA as I do now, I was filling in for Marianne Williamson when she was going out of town. And every year, for many, many, many years, she would go to London, usually almost for the whole month of June. And I think she'd been doing that almost since she was a child. And so I was filling in for her and I remember just having this thought of, well, what if sometime somebody in London that Mary Ann's lecturing for finds out about me and wants me to come to London, I would need a passport. <laughs> and I need to be ready. 
So that's when I got the passport that I already had when he asked me. So that's part of this whole process is when you're giving yourself permission and knowing that you're safe, prepare yourself. This is, one, this is one of the things I learned when I was at BYU for five minutes. <laughs> one of the, <laughs> what, they were, the Mormons love a good motto, and I love a good motto. So there was a motto for everything, but one of their mottos was, prepare yourself and the opportunity will come. Prepare, see, what we are trying to do most of the time is make an opportunity. Don't make an opportunity Prepare yourself, and the opportunity will appear. So one of the things in the Edwin Gaines book, The Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity, is where she talks about the woman, the little old lady who um, wanted to go on the cruise with her. And she told her, well, you know, it's like $1,000. And so the woman handed her a check and walked off, and the check was for $5. <laughs> and she was like, wait a minute. Well, you don't, you know, she goes, Oh, no, I heard you. I know it's $1,000. Just I'm going on that trip. You just put my name down. And she, they, it went back and forth. And finally, Edwin thought, well, she's crazy, so I'll just, take, I'll just send it to her later. Well, then the woman right away started sending her checks every week of like $3.25, $15, $11.80. $11 like this went on until it got up to the place where it was too late. It was the last date where you could do it. She, altogether, she'd given her like $80 or something like that. And by this time, the cruise was full anyhow. It was totally packed to capacity, and there were no seats anyhow. So Edwin called the woman and said, you know, I'm so sorry. Maybe you can go the next time. Blah, 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 blah. You don't have enough money. It's already full. The date has passed. And the, and the woman goes, no, I'm going on the cruise. Just don't even think of sending me that money back. Don't send me that money back. I'm going on that cruise. And Edwin's like, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. And the woman said, no, dearie, you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm going on that cruise. <laughs> and so Edwin was like, OK. <laughs> so she just hung up the phone and just said, I'll just send it back to her when we get back from the cruise. I don't want to argue with this woman. She's obviously got dementia or something. <laughs> so like a day later, this really rich woman calls Edwin who had paid for the cruise in full, like as soon as she could, called Edwin and said, you know, I'm in the middle of this court case. It's going to settle, da 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 so I can't go on the cruise. I've been on enough cruises to know it's non-refundable, and that you know I'm not going to get any of the money back, but I wanted to let you know so that in case there's somebody else you know who might want to have the ticket, <laughs> that you could just let them know that da 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 So Edwin called the woman and said, you are not going to believe what just happened. And the woman said, oh, yes, I would. My bags are by the door. <laughs> so when you give yourself permission and you feel safe, you prepare yourself and you say thank you because you've sealed the deal. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you, Vision. <laughs>